Welcome to episode 2057. I'm at a conference here in Tampa, Florida. I spoke yesterday, just came into their studio to do a little talk for something else, but thought I'd record for you as well. So today we have our continuing discussion with Neil Bawa from Monday's episode. Got a lot of great feedback on this. So let's go ahead and get to our main segment. Now ask the question, what is the likely bad scenario for banks? And I think you'll come up with a number of 60 to $100 billion. And while that seems like a lot of banks will go under, a typical mid-sized bank has $250 billion in holdings. And the total distress that I just described across all the mid-sized banks in the US is 60 to 100 billion. Yeah. Yeah. All across. Yeah, that's right. that's diversified amongst, you know, what, a couple thousand banks. I mean, we there, have there's 5,000, but yeah, 2,000 mid-sized banks. So yeah, right. you're exactly right. 2,000 banks, right? Uh, again, it's all about math. How can one bank end up having all of the bad loans in multifamily, but none of the good ones? People, the lesson here is, as you're listening to Neil talk about this stuff, is stop falling for this clickbait junk. As we surf around YouTube and read the news and read blog posts, we're like addicted to junk food as people. That's the way our minds work. We want to see this negativity. Well, there's the real people that are the real wealthy that are continuing to get wealthy. They're just kind of chugging along, doing their boring thing. You know, they're managing their properties. They're buying, you know, good, sensible investments. And they're just doing that day in and day out. And they're, they're just operators, right? They're not speculators. I mean, everybody at the beginning and in the middle and you know, even toward the end of the, the pandemic, you know, they were talking about how the world is falling apart when the complete opposite happened, right? So yep. look at the opportunities people missed. I, I would like to see some math on missed opportunities for one, but I'm never going to see it probably. So that's that. Neil, let's uh, switch gears here. There's, you're such an interesting guy. Do you want to talk a little bit about this seeming inflection point we're in in the technology world? I mean, look, you know, right after you were on the show before, the world was just discovering chat GPT. And the world was just kind of getting interested in artificial intelligence. And now everybody's talking about it. Yet, interestingly, only 57% of the country knows what chat GPT is. <laughs> Amazingly. I mean, a lot of people are going to be put out of a job, right? What do you think? They're going to be put out of a job and then put back into a job. So let, let me say this. So first to set the stage, right? Generative AI, not AI, which we've had for a year, uh, many years, but what what chat GPT and its equivalent is called generative AI. Right. That technology is the greatest technology invented by man since the invention of fire or the invention of the wheel. If you take, I the wouldn't internet, go that far, but go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll I'll I'll, I'll try to. I would know, say since the invention of the in. internet. I would say that if you take the internet, the smartphone, and the personal computer, so these are the three big technology booms of the last okay. 40, 35 years, yeah. and roll them up together, they would very easily be babies compared to AI. And the big reason is artificial intelligence is the biggest beneficiary of the smartphone, the computer, and the internet. All three of these are serving as a free foundation for AI. AI came into this world not as a baby, but as a teenager, mm -hmm. simply because the baking was basically done by the foundation. So on day one, artificial right. intelligence is a teenager instead of being a baby. And, yeah. and it's extremely baked and ready because of cloud infrastructure and things like that, where this progress that is being made is absolutely astonishing. So, mm -hmm. so to me, it is a vastly superior technology to the PC, the smartphone, and the internet put together. Mm -hmm. It is a technology that will both create the biggest disruption in the job market since the the 1929 crash, it, it will be the biggest since that time. So bigger than COVID, bigger than 2001, bigger than 2008. But it will also create the greatest amount of prosperity and has the potential to create the greatest amount of prosperity that the human race has ever imagined and possibly even beyond our imagination. Because generative AI fundamentally changes the way humanity makes progress. The way humanity makes progress is extraordinarily, exceedingly slow. It takes an extremely long time to learn the things that are necessary to make creative and high quality breakthroughs. For example, you're looking for a cure for blood cancer, right? There's a process and that process will probably take you 10 years to first figure it out and then 10 years to get approval, right? So maybe, maybe not the best example, but now that first 10 years, you can now cut that 10 years down to a single year 
by using a generative AI that is specifically trained to cure cancer. You can reduce climate change impact by training an AI to specifically look at every climate change impact in the world and every clim climate change remediation action and basically create plans. You can even get better politics out of it, though I don't predict that's ever going to happen because politicians are in charge. So obviously they're, they're not, they're not going to make themselves obsolete. But fundamentally, every single thing that humanity does today to create and maintain our civilization is about to get turbocharged. That's mm -hmm. generative AI because it's, it's not about uh, writing resumes. It's not about writing blog articles. Those are just the initial things that we got done to get started and to see the potential. What is coming is, is the ability to take every single thing that humanity does. For example, high-end high chip design creation, right? There's two critical companies in the world, one's in Taiwan called TSMC, and then there's a company that basically makes the machines that TSMC yep. uses and, and they're in, the, in, in Sweden um, or Norway. Um, those two companies, there's too much knowledge concentrated in those companies, right? But if you were to train a generative AI on all concepts of chip design, it would solve all of the things that these two companies are doing without any patents, without any patent infringement within a one to two year time frame, because they get, they get good so quickly, right? Yeah. And so every problem that is a very, very difficult problem that humanity has faced is no longer very difficult. That's the potential of generative AI. But along the way, Jason, along the way, we're going to eliminate roughly 10% of all jobs that humanity has today. So I, I wrote this in one of my emails just recently. I think it went out on Sunday, one of my email blasts. And it said, everybody's talking about the jobs that AI will kill, but nobody's talking about the prosperity it will create, right? And so I'm glad you said that because you're absolutely right. The thing is, though, this is such a leap, Neil, that when you look at artificial intelligence, it's not like, I mean, you know, AI is critical to self-driving autonomous cars, right? Sure. And, and so a huge percentage of the global population is involved in the transportation industry, yes. right? So if you wipe out those jobs, it's not like those are highly skilled people most of the time that can go become software engineers, although AI does write code, of course, maybe they can. I mean, when you invent something like the steam engine or the cotton gin or the sewing machine, you can see that those people formerly employed in sewing could go do something else because yes. it's a, a labor oriented job. It's kind of consistent in the level of skill set, right? Whatever the new job is going to be. But this time, isn't it different? It isn't. It's absolutely not different for one simple reason. The reason why places like the United States have a 97% employment rate, right? You, you look about that and say, how is it that we're always roaming around a 95, 96, 97% employment rate, right? That just seems unnatural. Maybe there's a person sitting there in the sky, or maybe there's a person in the real government that's always fiddling with this number. It's always between 95 and 97. Sort of during recessions will go up and then come back down very quickly. There's a reason why the unemployment rate stays in an extremely narrow band because it's a supply and demand issue. So when we get to the point where AI is going to basically take away a lot of jobs, like programmers, I think we're gonna need about a third of the programmers in 10 years that we need today. So now two thirds of the, those programmers are gone. What happens? I mean, technology has taken away billions of jobs, right? So one third of the entire world is still in farming. But in the United States, more than 90% of the people were in farming at the turn of the last century, right? So in, at 1900, one third of Americans were in farming. Today, it's 1%. 1% of Americans are farmers. What happened to the remaining 32%? Well, the answer is this. Whenever there's a technological breakthrough, it allows society to create more complexity. We used to have one electronic item in our home, which was, you know, our cordless phone, right? Or, right, in back in the 70s, right? 60 or 70, and then the microwave and then everything else in the television. It, that's complexity. Layers of complexity are created, but you cannot create more complexity until a major breakthrough is made. AI will create a series of millions of breakthroughs, allowing society to move to a new level of complexity. Every level of complexity requires more manpower. And so the people that get laid off, the software engineers, are going to be employed in developing a layer of complexity that doesn't exist yet. So I can't point to that level of complexity and say, Jason, these are the new jobs. Because there's no way I could have done that. In the 70s, I couldn't have guessed that millions of people will work in the telecommunications agency because everyone will have a smartphone, right? Mm -hmm. In 2007, I couldn't have guessed that this, the new smartphone will come out and will basically, there'll be three, four, five billion smartphones. So 
the breakthroughs that are fundamental create entirely new categories of employment. And because they're entirely new, I can't speculate what they are, but they've happened every single time we've created a breakthrough. It allows more complexity. Complexity means more jobs. That's and, the honest answer. Yeah, and Neil, you're, you're absolutely right about that. And what people, they tend to think in this kind of linear way that, okay, well, AI is going to replace all these jobs. But what they fail to think about is that human beings have a literally unlimited amount of desires they will create. As soon as one problem is solved, we're gonna want something else. That's our constructive discontent. Well, it's not always constructive, but it's discontent, okay? Yes. You know, I remember reading many years ago a book that influenced me a lot that I really liked, and I have not had the author on the show. I've gotta get him on, but Paul Zane Pilzer. He mm -hmm. wrote a book called Unlimited Wealth, the theory and practice of economic alchemy. And it was a fascinating read. And one of the things he said is he said that nobody, and this is gonna sound really old because you know, just think of the time, okay? No consumer realized that they needed a waterproof cordless phone until Sony made one. Then everybody with a pool or hot tub in the backyard had to have one. Right? Had to have this one, yep. Long before cell phones. Even though you're not gonna use it there, but you had to have one. Yeah. Right? And and so a lot of times, you know, in business, it's not about find a need and fill it. It's imagine a need and fill it. And that's what the best businesses do. You know, I remember Steve Jobs saying Apple never did focus groups. They didn't right. do surveys. They didn't do focus groups because the consumer really didn't know what they wanted. Right. right. They, they, they think in a linear way, like the true innovator has to think in leaps right and you know that's what the iphone was it was a leap at the time it's really interesting and, and who knows what we're all going to want in the future as ai starts to just solve so many of our problems so quickly well i know we will want more yeah, right that's true that, that is that <laughs> is key we will want more and that more never slows down it more it, it never stops we we always want more and now that we have AI, we can actually solve some of our biggest problems. So I, I believe that within the next 15 years, we will solve all food problems on this planet because food is basically a mathematical problem. Yeah. And today, thanks to generative problem. AI, it's a distribution problem. It's a, it's a math problem. And our ability to solve it was very restricted until now, right? But with generative AI basically focused on food problems, you can easily solve it in, in 15, 20 years. So now imagine a new industry where millions of people are involved in solving the world's food crisis. That industry doesn't exist today. There's gonna to be millions of people involved in new robotics industries because the problem with robotics was not robotics. We've had great robotics for a long time. Cars are built using robots since the 1980s. The problem was the intelligence in those robots didn't exist. And all of a sudden it does within the next two or three years. The, the greatest single robot currently existing is actually the Tesla Model 3. And most people don't understand that statement because they're like, you think of the Tesla Model 3 as the greatest robot of all time? The answer is yes. Firstly, it does a robot-like job. It carries you from one place to another. And today it is very, very close to being taking you from one place to another without your intervention. It's not quite there. Yeah. A billion dollars worth of you know equipment has just been purchased by Tesla to make that one final leap. But at the end of that time, it is a driving robot that 4 million people already own. It's a driving robot. Now imagine several thousand categories of robots, mm -hmm. people will need to create companies to build those levels of affluence. Right. We're about to see an extraordinary increase in humanity's affluence, an absolutely yeah. mind boggling increase far beyond anything that we've seen before. You know, I, I'm so glad you said that because everybody is just talking about all this doom and gloom, bad, bad fiscal and monetary policy. AI is going to kill everybody's job. You know, I agree with you. You know, it's the look at the prosperity that was created throughout history with steam engines, cotton gins, smartphones, personal computers. I mean, nobody could imagine this stuff. Even the really great futurists like Buckminster Fuller and Arthur C. Clarke and Isaac Asimov, they couldn't have envisioned the world we have today. Nobody and could have. It is truly an amazing time to be alive. It really yes. is. And this is going to go so quickly that literally in the next year, we will not recognize a lot of things that we perceive today. I mean, it's going it to will accelerate, so right? Today, I, I do feel that we have people better than Isaac Asimov. I'm a huge fan. I just finished watching the second se season of Foundation. Asimov knew, knew oh, what he was talking about. I don't even know what that about, is, right? but I used to read his books the, when I was a kid. Yeah, <laughs> Foundation's kind of his biggest kind of you know series. 
Bottom mm-hmm. line, though, today, I think that the people that we have that are futurists are actually better than the Buckminster Fullers of the world or the or the Edisons of the world. I suggest that if somebody is feeling bad about AI losing jobs, you've got to read Tony Seba. Tony is CEO of Rethink X, Rethink X. And they have a series of five videos on YouTube about five major categories, food being one of them, transportation being another, energy being another. And I think by the end of those videos, you'll truly understand the impact of things like AI and the impact that AI is going to have on the world. And again, I can tell you, if you brought somebody in from the 80s to the way that we live today, that person Mm -hmm. would be hideously jealous. They would be ridiculously jealous. You put them back in the 80s, they're going to be very dissatisfied, though they're probably going to have a happier life. But that, that put aside, they would not want to lose all the doodads that we have access to today. But what we are, what's happening is because technology is exponential and AI is doubly exponential, if you take a person from today and put them into a world 10 years from now and then bring them back, we would all be extremely unhappy. Because you know, we're most... about to do to our health what we've done to technology. Technology has been in our hands, around us, but it's about to be in us. Mm -hmm. that's the part that's fundamentally different. And the rich people of the world will pay for it, right? Who's like, who's going to pay for it? Well, here's where income inequality actually comes to the rescue. Most of the money of the world that is spent today belongs to rich people. And there's no end to what rich people want as long as there's diversity. If you use AI uh, to create a better hair oil that grows your hair, every rich person in the world will buy it. If you create one that makes your skin look better, (laughs) they will buy it, right? The amount of money available for AI discoveries is never ending because of income you know, inequality in the, the, the world where most of the money is in the hands of the rich and the rich have no hesitation in ever spending a very large amount of money to fix a very small problem. Right, but then once they do that, that product or service becomes so much cheaper for everybody else. Everybody else, yeah. right? So you know, 20 it, years later, everyone has it, right? 10 yeah. years later, everybody has it. Yeah, yeah, right? absolutely, yeah. It's just fascinating. I bookmark Tony Saba. You know, it's easy, Neil, to talk about technology when we talk about bits, but technology gets tougher when you talk about atoms. Mm-hmm. So software is eating the world, but you know, when you want to turn that into robots in the physical world, that gets a lot more challenging. It's a lot more, a lot harder. So it, you can't do it as fast. Right. And that's why you're noticing that the, the people that are currently affected in the immediate time frame in the next 12 months by what's happening with ChatGPT, all of those positions are digital. So yeah. it's going to affect lawyers because lawyers basically read a bunch of things. That All of that stuff is digital. They do discovery. It's going to affect paralegals. It's going to affect copywriters. It's going to affect digital designers. All of these people work with digital content. Yeah. And so to get that to into the physical realm of robots and other things like that takes a lot longer, which is why when people ask me, is there going to be a huge impact to real estate? Yes. Is it going to be devastating? Yes. When is it going to happen? I think it's a minimum of 10 years out because getting to physical realms for AI is two orders of magnitude harder, which means 100 times harder or maybe a thousand times harder than manipulating bits, right? So the, the kind of jobs that we're gonna lose are the ones where people are basically working or somehow connected to bits and bytes. Luckily with real estate, it's a physical, intangible object that we're not making any more of, yeah. right? So well, I mean, it's, it's mostly about the construction materials, not the land. There is quite an abundance of land, okay? Well, I, I, you know, I, I'm gonna dispute that. So yeah. okay. there's there's more than enough land in the United States for us to increase our population by 10X. We know that, right? Yeah. But there's a, an extreme, extreme shortage in the places that people want to live in, not in Louisiana or West Virginia. In the places that people want to live in, there is an extreme shortage of land that has infrastructure. Infrastructure is key. What is what is the infrastructure that humanity needs to live? Number one, we need roads. Number two, we need water. Number three, we need all of the things that support the roads and the water, the internet access and things like that. When you look at land ready for construction in the United States, we are at the lowest level that we have been in the last 50 years. But that's because we don't have the infrastructure ability to spend the way we did in the 50s. We built an entire freeway system in the United States in a single decade, the 50s. Yeah. But today... In one year, we only add 1% to that infrastructure, just a single percent. And that's our cap on civilization because our, civil, our, our civilization is designed around freeways and cars. And until we change the way that we, w- that we build homes, and maybe AI will do that for us, but you, you're capped at that 1%. Yeah. 
How do you add on more land? Where is the money going to come from? I'm a developer. And I'm telling you the reason that Jason Hartman should be buying more existing single family homes is we're all going to be making less single family homes because my cost of construction, my cost of permits has doubled in three years. Mm -hmm. has doubled in three years. Why? Because the cities don't have any money left for sewers, for electrical, for roads, for trees, for parks. And we need all of those to expand the amount of land that is available to build. That's the key. It's a 1% cap every year. Yeah, that's a really good point, Neil. You know, most people think when they fly over the country, they think, oh, there's a lot of land, right? But, useless. but how, much yeah, land really is, how much of that land is connected by highways that's the first question. And then, of course, the second, third, fourth, fifth order questions are how much of that land has infrastructure like sewers, water lines, Internet, yep. you know, everything else. It's a much different equation. It's a it massive like. cost, yeah. right? I tried to build one property two miles outside a city, outside Idaho Falls. Yep. Just my infrastructure cost made the entire project unviable, even though my land was free. Yeah. Right. Wow. Just two miles. I Just two miles was too much. I would say even a mile would have killed it. Maybe if it was half a mile, I could have somehow eaten that cost. But that's how difficult infrastructure is in the United States. It's so expensive. Construction costs are so wildly out of control in the, in the U.S. that it's very, very difficult to get more land. Now, I know that there's one way in which this will be solved by AI, and that is self-driving. When we get to the point where robots are driving us around, we no longer need to live closer to cities. Right. In the San Francisco Bay Area, if you go out to Tracy, your home is worth maybe, you know, you can pay one third of what I pay here in, in sort of in the, in the middle of the San Francisco Bay Area. Tracy is about 50 minutes away. The, the big problem is people don't want to commute that 100 minutes every day. Sure. And so they're fighting for my piece of my land, my home. Instead but if of they a could take Tracy. a nap while they're doing that or, you know, sit in the car and work on their laptop. And work, or whatever, right? It and would work. be different. Exactly. Um, but the problem is, Neil, that still takes energy. Yes, you know, yes. and so electricity, I don't think is going to be the answer. I think that's a sort of a false promise on, on the electrical grid that just cannot handle electric cars. Now, granted, AI can make them more efficient and it will. Yes. But yes. these things, when it comes to atoms and energy, they're usually just incremental improvements. OK, I um, want you to watch the Tony Saba video on okay. energy. I, I agree with you that fundamentally energy is a very difficult problem to solve. In fact, in my mind, energy is much harder to solve than food because mm -hmm. we actually have the ability to make enough food. We just need to make some technological changes. Energy requires all together new technology, right? Yeah. For to solve the energy problem. But in my mind, we are in the best place that we ever have been to create new energy. M mankind has never created energy. We've always used existing energy. We started by burning wood. And then we basically moved on to burning fossil fuels of the, all different kinds. Wood is actually also a fossil fuel if you think about it. But essentially, all we've done is we've, we've transformed energy in all of our existence. We've never created energy. We're now at coming to the age of energy creation. But I agree with you. That's a very hard problem to solve. That's an yeah. extraordinarily hard problem to solve. Yeah, it right. sure is. You know, there's a great book. I was looking it up. I wanted to recommend it to our listeners, but it's got such a weird title. I can never remember the title of it, but it's really good. It's called something like Faster, Better, Smaller, and it's all about energy. And it just really explains the way energy works and energy density works. And it, it's just really fascinating. But, you know, I, I've recommended the book before on the show, but I, I just can't find it. It's got such a weird title. I can never remember it. Talk about bad branding. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> okay, Neil, another fascinating discussion. It's always fascinating with you. Wrap it up with anything you want to say, question I didn't ask, whatever. And then, of course, give out your website too. Yeah, to me, the biggest the biggest message that I would like to give to anyone listening today is all of you, if you had a time machine and you are a real estate investor, will probably go back to 2008. That's going to be your chosen. If you had one chance to go back on a time machine, you're going to go back to 2008. But here's the problem. Back in 2008, anyone that was trying to buy real estate, everyone thought that they were complete idiots. My family banned me from going to parties because they thought I would infect the other people in the family with my stupid thoughts on real estate. I was buying <laughs> one single family home in cash every month, every single month in 2008, oh. 2009, I'm buying one. And yeah. everyone thinks that I'm completely insane. My point is this, during times of distress, and today in multifamily seeing distress, single families not seeing distress at this point in time, during times of distress, there's never a time when there's just blue sky, because if there was blue sky, how would there be distress? So at any time, 
Money creation only happens when there is some form of distress. In 2009, no bank was willing to give you a loan. You had to buy properties in cash, put tenants in them, then go and refinance them later because no, no bank was willing to give you a loan on a $90,000 property that today is $400,000, right? You, you couldn't get a loan on that easily. You, you, you needed to have a tenant in there. My point is this, waiting for a perfect scenario means that you will be waiting forever. The less perfect a scenario, the more likely that you're going to make money. That is a really interesting way to look at it. And you know, you're backed up by a lot of evidence there because all of these great companies started during recessionary times, right? Even Microsoft, on the last Apple, round, all during recession, Airbnb, et cetera, yep. right? But way back to the world's first billionaire, J. Paul Getty, who was yeah. buying up oil stocks during the Great Depression, right? That's how he became a billionaire. You know, if it's in good times when the skies are blue, the money has largely left the equation, right? Yep, yep. There's there's no opportunity there. When you're investing in blue skies, you're the opportunity for someone else. You're it. You're the opportunity for somebody else, right? So but, you, you have to find situations that are less than perfect if you actually want to create money. Yeah. In other words, the most profit will always be made with a fixer upper. And it doesn't mean the house. It just means the situation, right? The situation. Uh, you got to fix her up right. Yeah. The, the problem there is, though, Neil, is there's different sort of degrees of blue sky, right? Like you might be at the beginning of the blue sky phase and have a three year run left where you're going to make a lot of profit on it, right? Or you might be at the end of the blue sky, you know, you just never know exactly where you are in that continuum, right? You never know. Like, for example, office, I wouldn't touch it with a 20 foot pole. It, it's it, the level of risk that I would be taking, even though office is in distress and I'm going to get discounts, big discounts, is just outrageous. Multifamily is in distress or is going to be distressed for at least five or six quarters. I'm fine with it. You know, I'll, I'll take that 30% discount that I'm getting and, and move ahead. So yeah. it, it's about levels of distress. You're right. And it's about where in the cycle are you? Sure. Yeah, very good. Give out your website. Multifamilyu.com. We have about 20,000 people a year that sign up for our webinars. We do 12 webinars a year. I just did one for artificial intelligence and 2,000 people signed up. I, it was basically called AI and, and the, the, the devastating change that it makes to the world economy and then the benefits. So things like that, I like to riff on a lot of different things. And obviously, we talk about real estate and we talk about the economy. Uh, check out multifamilyu.com. Excellent. Neil Bawa, thanks again for joining us. Thanks for having me.